tonight on CBC Vancouver News. People don't care anymore. People don't care about each other. People don't care about what's around them. From bad to worse, Vancouver's downtown east side reaches a tipping point also. He's been trying to be virtuous and he's obviously not virtuous. The ethics commissioner blasts the prime minister in the SNC-Lavalin controversy and... Pierogies and a peony legend, a fixture at the annual fair, passes away. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening. It is a conflict thousands of kilometers away. But the divisions in Hong Kong are being felt right here in the Lower Mainland. As Lian Young reports, the tense situation is not only dividing the community, it's dividing families. This is a regular occurrence for Sora Chan and Nicole Lowe, the two friends starting their mornings by checking in on the protests in Hong Kong, a fight they believe in. They're just fighting for their rights, fighting for their, like, freedoms and fighting for their future. I can see they're like fearless and they help out each other and they're way younger than me too. While the two friends might share similar views, there's no consensus in the Chan household. Several of the 27-year-old's relatives, including her mother, vehemently disagree with her and it's led to regular arguments. When she get to that stage of aggression, I would just, you know what, just, just stop. I don't want to talk to you anymore and I was just close my door. Chan made her views known to her family in 2014 during Hong Kong's umbrella movement, where she was among the hundreds of thousands who rallied. Her grandfather tried to sway her opinion then, even getting her to sign a form agreeing to support the government. We are having a dim sum time, like the round table, and my grand grandpa was like handing out all these sheets and saying like, okay, you guys, it's time to, okay, we finished the food right now and you guys time to sign it out. The conflict is playing out among many families in Metro Vancouver with Hong Kong roots. This UBC professor who studied the issue says opinion over the protests are often split over generational lines. Parents concerned about the growing violence, even if they did support the movement to begin with. In many Hong Kong family are now torn, okay, between where to go, okay, what should we do? And I will say more people feel more helpless and stressful uh, rather than, you know, they want to really support the government or they really support the young people. Jen Ng immigrated to Vancouver from Hong Kong decades ago. He's opposed to the violence and how it's being used in the name of democracy. I mean, if they want to do their, their stage their expression, that's fine. But they're now interrupting the livelihoods of other people, people who may not be in agreement with them. But for those who are deeply passionate about the issues in Hong Kong, it's going to take a lot to change any minds. For me, looking at Hong Kong right now, it's more like um, an animal's almost being killed and struggle for their last, last breath. And they just want to fight back. The one thing everyone can agree on, the hope for a peaceful resolution. Leanne Young, CBC News, Vancouver. The family of a 15-year-old boy mistakenly killed in a gunfight in Vancouver is pleading for help in finding the killer. Alfred Wong was riding a car with his family when he was hit by a stray bullet in January of 2018. Police say 23-year-old Kevin Whiteside was in the area of East Broadway and Ontario Street to kill 28-year-old Matthew Navas Rivas. Someone started shooting. Wong and Whiteside were both killed. Navas Rivas escaped unharmed, but was murdered in a separate incident months later. Police say they now have new information that people with key details about Wong's death have not yet spoken to police. They are not saying what that information is. Alfred Wong's family has released this statement through police. Alfred deserves justice for his tragic death, and we desperately want to know what happened that night. Without your help, the police may not be able to arrest the killer and our son will not be able to lay in rest. Anyone with information is asked to contact the VPD or Crime Stoppers. Well, from bad to worse, there is concern drug use and crime on Vancouver's downtown east side are growing. As John Hernandez reports, some say the neighborhood is reaching a tipping point. It just it looks very intimidating to somebody who might not be down here or hasn't been down here. It can look pretty crazy. 
Julie Louise Chapman has lived in the downtown east side for 18 years. A longtime advocate for low income residents here, she says the living conditions are the worst she's ever seen. The last two years, they've been the worst changes, I think. Like I said, a lot of homelessness, um, a lot of drug use out in the open, um, but you never used to see that at all, maybe not to that degree. It's been a challenging summer in this notorious neighborhood, headlined by this growing tent city in Oppenheimer Park. More than 100 people call this place home. Police say there's been a sharp increase in violent crime. Many nearby businesses are struggling. We have businesses who have told us they're having trouble uh, retaining staff who maybe don't feel as safe coming and going. We have one business who's told us they've had to close down their public facing operation. Vancouver Drug Policy Advisor Karen Ward says the ongoing opioid crisis has left people here hopeless. There was, a, you know, we're poor, but we take care of each other. That idea that there was a code, that there was, you'd look out for each other. Um, it's, it's, it is, it's falling apart. A community on the brink, but residents here find a way to endure. I'm immune to it, I'm used to it. I don't pay it no mind. I'm part of it, I'm here. Peter Sukup says amenities like shelters and food give most a reason to stay. You can eat every day and eat well without spending money, then you can use your money to buy your, your drugs. The city of Vancouver introduced a five-year plan to improve the downtown east side back in 2014. One of the main pillars of that strategy was to make life easier for low-income residents. But in the time since that was passed, homelessness in the neighborhood has swelled. For now, the city says its main goal is to find housing for people living in Oppenheimer Park. John Hernandez, CBC News, Vancouver. BC's police watchdog is investigating the shooting of a machete-wielding man in Surrey this morning. Surrey RCMP were responding to a call about a man with a machete shortly after 4 a.m. in North Surrey. They shot the man who was allegedly chasing another man. The injured man was taken to hospital with non-life-threatening gunshot wounds. No one else was hurt. The IIO investigates all officer-related incidents that result in harm or death. Police on Vancouver Island say they have identified persons of interest in a case of a chosen man found dead in his home in July. Police say they don't think there's a risk to the public and they are continuing to gather information to support charges against those responsible for Martin Payne's killing. They have also released a photo hoping to jog someone's memory. Police would like to identify the owner of this backpack. It was found three days before Payne's body. And with the federal election just 10 weeks away, it could be a costly blow for the Liberals. As Katie Simpson reports, the Ethics Commissioner says Prime Minister Justin Trudeau broke ethics rules in the SNC-Lavalin scandal. Facing a damning assessment of his actions, the Prime Minister today acknowledged mistakes were made. What happened will never happen again on his watch, Justin Trudeau says, but don't for a moment think he's sorry. What we did over the past year uh, wasn't good enough. But at the same time, I can't apologize for standing up for Canadian jobs. In his report, Ethics Commissioner Mario Dion found the Prime Minister directly and through his senior officials used various means to exert influence over Ms. Wilson-Raybould. There were many ways Trudeau went about trying to bend the will of the former Attorney General, directing his staff to find a solution that would safeguard SNC-Lavalin's business interests. The buck stops with the Prime Minister uh, and I assume responsibility for uh, everything that happened in my office. While he is now publicly accepting responsibility, he told Dion something else. Mr. Trudeau argued that he could not be held vicariously liable for the actions of his senior advisors and other senior departmental officials. Dion didn't buy it. The evidence abundantly shows that Mr. Trudeau knowingly sought to influence Ms. Wilson-Raybould both directly and through the actions of his agents. I experienced a consistent and sustained effort by many people within the government to seek to politically interfere. The independent investigation lines up with the version of events presented by the former Attorney General, who describes the report as a vindication of sorts. I certainly believe that there is enough evidence here to uh, warrant a, an RCMP investigation. 
Amid renewed calls for police to step in, the RCMP said it is examining this matter carefully and will take appropriate actions as required. And what we have now is a clear picture of who Justin Trudeau truly is, and it's not who he promised he would be. Trudeau's opponents were quick to point out this is his second ethics violation. A family vacation in 2016 to the Aga Khan's private island broke the rules since the spiritual leader had lobbied the government. Mr. Trudeau cannot be the Prime Minister of Canada and uh, I'm hoping people in the election coming up make that decision. Former Attorney General Jody Wilson-Raybould releasing a statement today saying she's grateful for the report as it confirms what she has been saying all along. She says the report represents a vindication of the independent role of the Attorney General and of the Director of Public Prosecutions in Criminal Prosecutions and reinforces for Canadians how essential it is to our democracy to uphold the rule of law and the prosecutorial independence. Of course, Wilson Raybould was kicked out of the Liberal caucus not long after she quit her job as Attorney General. This fall, she's running as an independent candidate in Vancouver Granville. That's where the CBC's Mira Baines is right now. Mira, what are people saying in the riding today? Well, Anita and Mike, hot on the heels of that report from the Ethics Commissioner, there is mixed reaction here in the riding of Vancouver Granville. As you mentioned, Jody Wilson-Raybould will be running as an independent in this riding. The Liberals picked their candidate last night. Back in 2015, Jody Wilson-Raybould was the star candidate in this riding. And this is what people had to say about today's developments. The fighter, and I think a lot of people will vote for especially around this area. I have my questions about uh, how how this story was dealt with and how it's been uh, dragged out over months and months and months uh, leading up to an election. He's been trying to be virtuous and he's obviously not virtuous and the only virtuous person in the whole thing was, was Jody. She just seemed genuine and believable and the story she was telling had a ring of truth to it for sure. And Mira, last night the Liberals acclaimed their candidate for the riding. Uh, what did he have to say about running against uh, Wilson Raybould in this fall's election? Well, Mike, interesting timing for that event last night. The Liberals acclaimed Talib Noor Mohammed, a 42-year-old uh, tech entrepreneur, as their candidate for this riding of Vancouver Granville. In 2011, he had actually ran for the federal Liberals in North Vancouver and lost. And last year, he did try to attempt to run for the uh, to become a mayoral candidate for Vision Vancouver, but he withdrew from that race due to heart concerns. He says some of those health concerns are not an issue anymore, that he's doing much better. And he, at the event last night, was asked about how he feels about running against Jody Wilson-Raybould and uh, how he feels uh, people are concerned or not about SNC-Lavalin. This is what he had to say. Look, as I've been talking to voters and citizens in this riding, what I'm hearing is that there's the, there, are, there are deep concerns. But those concerns are about housing, they're about transportation, they're about jobs, they're about climate change. That's what we're hearing on the doorstep. People are concerned about the issues that matter to them. With an election around the corner, this riding of Vancouver Granville is definitely one to watch. The CBC's Mayor Baines reporting live tonight. Thank you. Well, a warning now from the Better Business Bureau about so-called sextortion email scams, trying to blackmail people out of money with compromising images. The scammers typically email the victim saying they've hacked into their computer and have photos or videos of them watching pornography. The scammer then threatens to send those images to friends, family or co-workers if a payment isn't made. The BBB says the emails sound convincing because criminals are obtaining legitimate usernames, passwords, and personal information that's been compromised during a security breach. If you do get a sextortion email, do not respond. Make sure you delete the email. Whatever ransom or whatever request that they're demanding of you, you do not carry it out because scammers like to play on fear. They want to intimidate you and put you in a position where you feel like you have to spend this money to protect yourself, and in most cases, you don't. The BBB says it's aware of at least two people who've fallen for the scam. Each one of them lost about $1,000. 
RCMP in Port Alberta recommending charges against two teenage boys caught red-handed after some damage to a pair of Heritage Railway cars. Today, volunteers with the Western Vancouver Island Industrial Heritage Society assess the mess left behind. RCMP say officers were called to the Alberni Pacific Railway Roundhouse around 1.30 p.m. Monday after someone spotted the boys inside one of the train cars. They broke some windows to get in because they were locked. Both of these were locked. And, and they, whatever they had inside, there's about five fire extinguishers that they smashed windows with and then squirted them off. And anything else that was in there, they found that they could kick the windows out with because all the glass pretty much is laying outside. The boys are aged 17 and 14 and have been arrested. They've also since been released on a promise to appear in court on mischief charges. The society hopes donations from the public will help cover the cost of damages. Time for our first check of the forecast. Brett is here. It was a beautiful day today. I mean, there's really just nothing to complain about. I know everyone has their preferred temperature ranges, and we always, like, you know, have a nice cloudy day every once in a while, but it was just such a beautiful day. We were hosting musical nooners earlier on in the afternoon. Lots of good people coming out for that, and the trend is really going to be continuing over the next 24 hours or so. So if I wanted to show you a look at our current temperatures right now, you're going to notice that, really, it's actually quite nice, and in fact, uh, let's see if I can go back to it there. We'll see. There we go. Some of our current temperatures looking around 24 degrees here into the lower mainland a little warmer into the Fraser Valley. There's really not that much going on on our satellite and radar because really it's just sunny. And as I said, I don't think anyone's going to be terribly complaining about that. Into our overnight period, it's going to be a very similar story. As I said yesterday, temperatures not really going low, below 14 degrees. That is a little cooler toward the Tri-Cities, maybe going down to about 13. But when it comes to tomorrow's forecast, I mean, it's going to be pretty much identical to what we have today. Hopefully you don't find that boring. It gives you another excuse to be able to get outside and enjoy it. Temperatures wise spread right around 23 24 degrees so that would be seasonal for this time of year however you're already probably wondering you may have slightly heard about this there could potentially be some rain this weekend I don't necessarily buy it and when I come back for my full forecast I'm gonna give you the reasons why so until then hang tight and try to get outside and enjoy this beautiful sunshine and these warm temperatures while you still can thanks very much Brett well his pierogies are as beloved at the PNE as mini donuts and the old wooden coaster Bill Connick, better known as Hunky Bill, died yesterday. He dished out his trademark Ukrainian-style dumplings to countless customers over decades. CBC Vancouver News at 11 host Dan Burt has a look back on a life well served. They didn't know the difference between a hockey puck and a pierogi in those days. For 52 years, this was Bill Connick's summer playground. The original p and &E pierogi peddler got his start at the fair in 1967. Over a cold beer, a friend bet him $10 he couldn't get a booth at the exhibition. Challenge accepted. Connick was a natural salesman. He ran a restaurant that bore his trademark nickname. He faced a human rights complaint over it in the early 80s from a Ukrainian-Canadian group who claimed the term was derogatory. Hunky, where I come from, was an affable, lovable term within the group of our own people and those were the immigrants that built this country. Hunky Bill won. Because they're going to have to face their friends in the community and say I'm the one that uh, was chased after Hunky Bill. Connick claimed to retire in 2011 but couldn't stay away from the PE. He says the business kept him young and if you still weren't sure about his nickname, get a job. Connick loved his job for more than half a century. That love is now being carried on by sons and grandchildren. They plan to keep the business going and will be ready to serve when the p &E opens. Pierogies and all for their namesake. Hunky Bill Connick was 88. Dan Burr at CBC News, Vancouver. Definitely a legend. I interviewed him a few yeah, years I saw back. That. And um, he was just a pleasure to be around. And his pierogies yeah. were delicious. Yeah, a fixture at the p &E for sure for so, so many years. Mm -hmm. And we will have more on his legacy on our website, cbc.ca slash bc. You can also watch Dan's story again by downloading the free CBC Gem app. CBC Vancouver also on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. You can follow us on all platforms for extra content you won't see on TV. Well, they won't be forgotten. A new memorial along the Alaska Highway set up by a trucker to remember the northern BC homicide victims. That's coming up. Well, Canada's spy agency has a recruitment and retention problem. That's according to 
and an internal document prepared for the head of the Canadian Security Intelligence Service. There are concerns a hiring slump could affect the ability of CSIS to monitor threats. Catherine Tunney has the details. The director of CSIS sat down with the governor general earlier this year and ran Julie Payette through some of the top concerns facing the intelligence agency. And near the top of that list were retention and recruitment. Now, details of this visit were obtained through an access to information request. We went to CSIS to try to get more information, maybe a breakdown of their staffing levels. They are keeping a lot of that information secret, um, but they did release a statement which says, while I can't go into detail about staffing levels, what I can say is that we're always looking for Canadians who want to be part of the mission to keep their country safe. Part of our effort in recruiting top talent is educating Canadians that gone are the days of people in beige trench coats. Now, without concrete numbers, it's hard to speculate about how dire the situation is. But former CSIS employees did speak to CBC this week and said that th this could be a risk. That, of course, you want your spies to be the best of the best. We are talking, of course, about people who are out there collecting intelligence um, and trying to protect Canada when it comes to national security. Uh, Phil Gursky is a former CSIS analyst. If you don't have enough bodies to do investigations, then, you know, the bad guys can get away with more because the good guys, th there's not a sufficient number of good guys to keep tabs on them. Now, almost every former CSIS employee that CBC spoke to this week said that mobility is one of the key issues when it comes to recruitment and retention. Intelligence officers have to agree to relocate almost anywhere in Canada at a moment's notice. That's not ideal, of course, for every family. There's also a very long hiring process. It takes about 18 months to clear all the security uh, clearances and pass all the tests. That um, doesn't fly by a lot of people. Often people apply and then uh, they get hired and, and move on to another job. Even if they do stay on, there aren't a lot of promotions. Um, and of course, you can often make more money in the private sector. And these are all reasons uh, that, that former CSIS employees say could be the reason behind the retention and recruitment concerns. Now, CSIS did say that it is concentrating on its co-op program to hire university grads and is concentrating on career fairs as well to try to hire more people. Catherine Tunney, CBC News, Ottawa. Stay with us. We will be back with some more news in just a few moments. A developing situation in Philadelphia tonight. At least six police officers have been shot in what officials say is an active and ongoing standoff. I'm trying to let him know that he can end this peacefully now. We've called him multiple times. He has picked up the phone a couple times, but he has not answered. The six officers do not have life-threatening injuries and are in good spirits, we're told. The standoff began after police tried to serve a warrant at a home. After the gunman opened fire, officers shot back. Some managed to escape through windows and doors, but there are concerns two officers are still trapped inside. A memorial has been set up to remember a young couple murdered along the Alaska Highway in northern B.C. As Mike Reddick reports, one trucker felt compelled to take action to honor the pair and their families. Twice a week, Ed Grennan drives his semi-truck between Fort Nelson and Whitehorse. It's a lonely stretch of highway with long hours and fast distances. But something was deeply bothering him. Grennan has passed by the location where the young couple died on the Alaska Highway. He felt something should be done to remember the victims so they will not be forgotten. Life is so short sometimes, and their life was very short. And they were living their life to their fullest, you know, all the, everything I've seen on uh, them in red, that, uh, yeah, they were enjoying life to the fullest, and the cut, they got cut down on life just when they were really enjoying life. He has placed an Australian flag to remember Lucas Fowler and an American flag to remember China Dees. 
along with a floral cross to mark the location where the young couple was found. On July 15th, Fowler and Deese were found dead on the side of the road. That launched a nationwide manhunt for Cam McLeod and Briar Schmagelski. RCMP believe they were the suspects in the couple's death. Grennan says he has an understanding of what Fowler and Dee's parents must be going through. I lost my daughter when she was 17, and you'll never, never get over it. You learn to live with it, but you never get over it. It's just one of those things in life that it happens overnight, and you wake up in the morning, and this is what happened, right? So, yeah, it's just it's such, it's such a tragic, such a tragic that... Grennan says the roadside memorial is on behalf of all the truckers who drive the Alaska Highway. I actually went by there a few times and broke down, you know. It's a very emotional thing for people that lost somebody like that. Very hard on a family, and I know exactly, you know, what they must be suffering, you know, the beautiful kids, you know, the wonderful girl, the wonderful guy. It has deeply affected other truck drivers. Grennan says when he drives by the site, he says a prayer. He now feels the couple won't be forgotten. He wants the families to know that the Alaska Highway truck drivers are thinking of them. Mike Rudick, CBC News, Whitehorse. While voters in Canada are still waiting for the official start to October's federal election. But unofficially, the main political parties are already campaigning. And so are private political groups that don't have any formal party status. As the CBC's Bonnie Allen tells us, these groups are playing a controversial and potentially influential role. When this billboard popped up in Regina, directly targeting Saskatchewan's only Liberal Member of Parliament, he wasn't impressed. It's a kind of um, ugly American way of, uh, of campaigning. Uh, it doesn't really fit with the, with, uh, the traditions and the values that uh, are pretty typical here in, in Saskatchewan. Similar billboards have gone up in Edmonton and Calgary targeting Alberta's three Liberal MPs. More are slated for Manitoba and some swing ridings in Ontario. They're paid for by a political action committee known as a PAC that's touting Western alienation. It's aimed at the Liberals because they've done significant harm to Western Canada, its industries and its way of life. It's desperate. It's increasingly desperate um, what's going on here and that Eastern Canada doesn't understand that. Leading up to the election, PACs must now register their donors and their expenses with Elections Canada. In this case, it's Conservative allies fueled by oil and gas money. The West Watch campaign rails against the carbon tax, stalled pipeline projects, job losses, and strained diplomatic relations with China that's hurting farmers. He's a yes man to the 1%. They're going up against other PACs, such as the left-leaning Engage Canada. People look at the power that PACs have in the United States and the deep influence they have and the influence of money and go, is this happening in Canada? We have a very different regulatory uh, framework. Under new rules, third parties can spend about one and a half million dollars on ads targeting an individual or a party, and less than fifteen thousand dollars in any one electoral district. But social media is hard to track. And I think everyone's worried that we are looking at an ugly campaign. I've been involved in the political process long enough to uh, uh, to roll with the punches. In this case, the punches came early and not from a formal political opponent. Bonnie Allen, CBC News, Regina. Recession fears intensifying today as the Dow Jones Industrial Average plummeted. The Dow Jones plunging 800 points. That's about 3% today. The TSX in Toronto down 300 points. Worsening economic data and the escalating U.S.-China trade war. All factors in recent dips and recession fears. A 16-year-old climate activist set sail from England to the U.S. after the break. Why, it's certainly no pleasure cruise.
Here are some of the stories we're following tonight on CBC Vancouver News. It looks very intimidating to somebody who might not be down here or hasn't been down here. It can, it can look pretty crazy. As Vancouver's downtown east side reached a tipping point, there is concern drug use and crime are growing fast. Advocates want the city to do more, but for now the focus is on finding housing for people living in tents in Oppenheimer Park. I think when you pretend that you're for everybody and you're shown that you're just as bad as everybody else, that it comes back and haunt you. Reaction in former Attorney General Jody Wilson-Raybould's riding to the findings of the Ethics Commissioner in the SNC-Lavalin affair. The commissioner says the Prime Minister violated the Conflict of Interest Act. Life is so short sometimes, and their life was very short, and they were living their life to their fullest. Truckers have set up a memorial to remember the young couple murdered on a remote stretch of the Alaska Highway in northern BC. They say something needed to be done to pay tribute to Lucas Fowler and China Deese. Well, after two days of violent protest, it was pretty much business as usual at Hong Kong International Airport today. As Tanya Fletcher reports, while demonstrators were moved out by riot police, the question now is, what happens next? The violence between protesters and police hasn't stopped, but it has moved elsewhere. The clashes turn from the airport back to the streets. This group of demonstrators descending on a police station to denounce police brutality. Some aiming laser pointers at the building. Their actions met with tear gas from riot police. The looming concern is how Beijing will respond. New satellite images appear to show a significant Chinese military buildup along Hong Kong's border. Other footage shows more paramilitary personnel stationed in the neighboring city of Shenzhen. The unrest is stirring up unease around the world. Nearly two dozen countries now posting travel advisories, including Canada. Currently, our advice is to exercise a high degree of caution. The Foreign Affairs Minister is now publicly warning Canadians, not just travellers, but also the 300,000 living in Hong Kong. She chose her words very carefully when asked about China describing the protests as near-terrorist acts, words interpreted by many as a threat. I think that it is very important everywhere in the world uh, for governments to listen carefully to their people. Others, not so subtle. I think China has overreacted. Emily Lau is a pro-democracy leader with a strong message. We are calling on Beijing not to do anything foolish, like moving more troops across the boundary into Hong Kong. This is not Tiananmen Square. Other answers will come from the demonstrators themselves, their message laced with determination. But we still continue with our courage and urge government must listen to our voice. Joshua Wong is one of the original protest leaders. And I hope people around the world still keep Hong Kong under the global spotlight. He says they're planning another demonstration for Sunday and expecting half a million people. Tanya Fletcher, CBC News, Vancouver. teenage climate change activist who inspired students and protests around the world has started her zero emission trek across the Atlantic Ocean. Susan Ormiston has more on the journey and why it's not much of a pleasure trip. Greta Thunberg, the 16-year-old climate activist from Sweden, has left the port of Plymouth and she's on her way to America on a 60-foot sailing yacht skippered by a professional crew and she's accompanied by her father. She's chosen to sail to America instead of flying, making a point that there's too much carbon emitted from air travel. She says she's not telling people what to do, she merely wants to set an example. I'm just doing this because I want to do this myself and uh, I am one of the very, very few people in the world who actually can do this, and then I think I should take that chance to do this. 
A year ago, this young woman was barely known, but in that year, she's really cut a swath across Europe and become a high profile climate activist. That has also made her a target of climate deniers and people who believe that she is being manipulated by adults to spread the climate crisis message. She brushes that off saying, they don't have to believe me, I'm sticking behind the science. And she's hoping that people will consider her message and her method of travel and think about it in the future. Once in the Americas, she's going to be attending a number of high profile climate conferences in New York at the UN, in Chile, and she told me she will be coming to Canada as well. Greta Thunberg has been a real phenomenon, particularly amongst young people who believe that they are inheriting a polluted planet and have lined up to follow her lead. Off to America, the voyage is expected to take about two weeks, give or take, depending on weather. Susan Ormiston, CBC News in Plymouth. A live shot of BC Place at 6.37 on this Wednesday evening. More sunny skies in the forecast, but the lows are dropping. Brett has the full forecast after the break. Brett home here is uh, is here with a <laughs> look at the forecast. Yeah. And while the weather's been pretty decent here, you've mm -hmm. also been tracking a big storm overseas. Yeah, that's right. We've been tracking various typhoons over the past week into the northwest portion of the Pacific. But right now, we're actually tracking, which would be just under the category of Typhoon Crosa. You're taking a live look at right now at Nagasaki. And uh, I've got another look for you of Miyazaki City. And these are some of the regions right now that are going to be at the greatest risk of undergoing some torrential rainfall and very strong winds because that typhoon that I mentioned is actually would be called a very severe uh, storm right now. It's actually just about to make landfall as we speak. So this is quite literally about an hour away. Um, it is close. It is about 14 hours ahead of local time right now. So this is going to be making its way onshore into the very near future. And really right now the biggest concern is the winds. We're looking at sustained winds of 100 kilometers an hour gusting anywhere potentially between 150 to 160. It's going to be traveling quite quickly across Japan and then eventually this will be making some of its 
way, actually, if you can believe it, over toward us here in BC. It's going to take a little bit of while to do so. In the meanwhile, I wanted to draw your attention to the fact that part of the northern regions of our province are going to be getting some significant rain. Talking specifically about the Peace region throughout the next 48 hours, we could be seeing anywhere between 20 and 40 millimeters accumulating there. Meanwhile, throughout the rest of the day on Friday, we're going to be seeing some rain making its way down to the southeast, kind of mirroring the track of the Rockies. But if you've noticed one thing, down here in the south coast in Vancouver, we're not really seeing a whole heck of a lot, and that is really going to be the case for the next little while. The reason for that is simple. We've been dealing with a nice little ridge of high pressure. This has been keeping us dry, but preventing any of those temperatures from budging too much. But we are going to see this change coming into the weekend, even though it may not necessarily be raining. It is worth mentioning that a sunny sky is in place for tomorrow, 25 degrees. But when we get down to Saturday, temperatures are going to be going to around 20 degrees, which is going to be a little bit cooler than usual. However, into the next day, we're going to be looking at temperatures rebounding once more over towards seasonal. And once again, that would be right around 23 degrees with a mix of sun and cloud. So not too shabby, I think. Not too not shabby, shabby at all. Yeah. Very good. <laughs> all right, Brett, thanks very much. You're welcome. Well, it's uh, pretty much everywhere from supermarket shelves to workplace refrigerators and at-home brew pots. I actually make my own as yes, well. Yes, I've heard that. <laughs> as kombucha rises in popularity, so have claims of its health benefits and questions about whether there's much scientific backing. Yeah, and even though I love the taste, we sent out Belle Puri to look at what's true and what's not about the popular drink. It's fizzy, fermented, and it's flying off the shelves. Kombucha has become big business in recent years. Last year, it surpassed more than a billion dollars in global sales. Much of the demand comes from consumers who want a healthy alternative to pop and other sugary beverages. It's supposed to help just with your digestion and just make you feel a little better overall. Uh, apparently, it's good for my gut health, as my girlfriend tells me. It helps probably mostly with digestion and just overall health. Um, it's good hydration. Drinkers and producers alike will tell you kombucha can help with a range of health problems. Digestion for starters, but also inflammation, obesity, headaches. Some even suggest the drink can increase resistance to cancer or reduce the risk for Alzheimer's and Crohn's disease. But does science back up this idea that kombucha is good for you? As early as 220 BC, members of the Sin Dynasty in northeast China believed it would detoxify and energize them. As it grew in popularity, health-conscious individuals started brewing kombucha at home. That turned into a cottage industry and eventually mass production. So every batch of kombucha that you make starts with a little bit of kombucha from the previous batch. So we're going to pour that in to start. Next, we're going to add our tea into the same jar that we just previously used. And add boiling water. And we're going to let that steep for about half an hour. After your tea is steeped, we're going to add the sugar in and stir it up. You want to stir until all the sugar is dissolved. Then we're going to strain the tea into the previously made kombucha, which is also referred to as the starter. We're going to immediately add some cold water. This is going to bring the temperature down. Then we're going to strain out the tea. Cool. Lastly, we're going to add in the SCOBY. SCOBY is just a symbiotic culture of bacteria and yeast. It's what makes the magic happen. So put it in there. And then uh, we're going to cover the top. From there, the drink is left to ferment, sometimes for days, sometimes for weeks. And studies show that process could be good for you. Fermented foods, it has little microorganisms that might fight for space in the gut and take up space so that bad bacteria are not there. And two, fermented foods might increase the bioavailability of vitamins and minerals. But while kombucha may be good for your gut, evidence into its other possible benefits remains limited. Some studies suggest it could combat cancer, aid in digestion, and promote liver health. However, researchers say those outcomes have only been seen in animals and in labs. When it comes to animal studies versus human studies, we can't exactly extrapolate those benefits to humans. Generally speaking, kombucha is considered to be safe for anyone to use. It does include some alcohol, of course, because of the fermentation process. That's usually in the range of half a percent, but it can go up to 3%, depending on how long the kombucha is left to ferment. 
people with compromised immune systems, children, pregnant women, the elderly, probably should stay clear. Ironically, the most serious ailment associated with kombucha use is overconsumption. The BC Centre for Disease Control says no more than half a cup per day. Belpuri, CBC News, Vancouver. It is a virus that has killed hundreds. Coming up, why scientists may be a step closer to slowing the tide of a deadly Ebola outbreak. White-tailed deer are a common sight across Canada, and generally they aren't too much of a threat to people. But a group of scientists is worried the animals could pose a risk to our food system, and they're urging the government to act. Alison Northcott explains the concerns around what some people call zombie deer disease. At this Montreal butcher, Quebec venison is on offer, and staff here are more than confident it's safe. We always get this deer meat from uh, always the same uh, the, the same uh, uh, supplier and uh, that supplier never uh, really uh, had any problems. The Canadian Food Inspection Agency says animals like deer and elk slaughtered in abattoirs in Quebec, Saskatchewan, Alberta, Manitoba and Yukon must be tested for chronic wasting disease or CWD before the meat can be sold for food. The disease affects the central nervous system in hooved animals like deer and is similar to mad cow disease. While the CFIA says there is no direct scientific evidence it can be transmitted to humans, it recommends people don't eat infected meat and says there is a range of precautions to keep it out of the food system. But three new cases detected on Alberta farms this year have some calling on the government to do more. The Canadian Food Inspection Agency, which is under the jurisdiction of our federal health minister and Health Canada, has to uh, create a new policy immediately uh, that ensures that no meat from contaminated uh, CWD farms, deer or elk in Canada, is permitted to go into the human food chain. 
part of her concern is around what happened last year when the disease was confirmed at a deer farm in Quebec. The herd was culled along with wild deer in the surrounding area. But CFIA has said the meat that tested negative was allowed to be sold for food, even though its website states a negative test doesn't guarantee the animal is not infected. Still, one researcher who has studied the disease for years says the risk to consumers buying farmed meat is exceptionally low, but says hunters should be careful. I'm never going to say there's no risk. Again, I think that the, main, the bigger risk is to hunters that aren't testing their animals or that are eating test positive animals. Quebec's red deer producers say last year's case has had a ripple effect on the industry. All of us are concerned about about that because uh, the Venetian market is uh, uh, very, very disturbed. The CFIA says none of the animals from the last two cases entered the food system and the farms remain under quarantine. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. Scientists may be a step closer to slowing the tide of the deadly Ebola outbreak that's already killed hundreds. Two new experimental drugs have shown promise of a possible cure after successful clinical trials in Congo. CBC's Christine Birak has more on why that's giving patients and frontline workers new hope. You don't often hear the word cure, but it's being used to describe two experimental Ebola drugs. Both are now being offered to patients infected with the deadly virus. There's no doubt that this is a major advance. This is something we've never had before. A study found when patients were treated within three days of being infected, 94% of those given the Regeneron drug survived, as did 89% of patients taking monoclonal antibody 114. Results so impressive, the trial was stopped. Two other less effective drugs were dropped, including ZMAP, which was largely developed by Canadian scientists. All these other treatments, Regeneron, RD114, and everything else that is coming up, is coming up because ZMAP, uh, was a trailblazer. So what makes these new drugs better? Both require only a single dose. Neither needs to be stored frozen like the older drugs did, making them easier to transport in hot temperatures. Where they differ is in how they fight the virus. Monoclonal antibody 114 uses a single antibody taken from the blood of an Ebola survivor. Regeneron's drug attacks the deadly virus using three antibodies, each combined to different sites on the virus, increasing the chances of blocking off a mutated Ebola virus. For the first time, we have something that we can use to directly fight against the virus. And so for me, that, um, that's incredibly, um, it, it's, it gives me an incredible amount of hope. The current Ebola outbreak in Congo is the second largest in history, killing at least 1,800 people and infecting about 2,800. Doctors say controlling the spread of the disease has been hampered by militia violence and local resistance to outside help. So we are hoping that with these new results that show such promise that we can be very convincing now to the community for the population of the DRC to accept to come to the treatment units because if they come early, their chance of survival is really good. Still, these new drugs won't get rid of Ebola, but many hope they might help stop these outbreaks from turning into major epidemics. Christine Birak, CBC News, Toronto. Escaping from a farm and on the run after the break, a massive emu on Vancouver Island even outruns the cops.
an escaped emu is now back resting on its farm, but not without some police intervention. Yes, drivers were kind of shocked to see this. An emu whose name, by the way, is Parker. That's Parker sprinting down a road in Chimanos over on Vancouver Island, trailing behind him an RCMP vehicle, lights flashing. It was causing a little bit of traffic chaos to passing motorists, so the officer and other responding officers decided to block traffic in both directions. I really don't know how he got out. After speaking with Animal Control, police developed a plan. They ended up tasering Parker with about 50,000 volts so they could restrain him and return him to his farm. Don't worry, Parker wasn't injured by the shock. Now he's most likely planning the next great escape. All right, so as the newbie at CBC, I know you didn't want anyone to know about this, but we have to razz you a little bit. It's your birthday. Happy birthday, what? Mike. Oh, I tried to keep it a secret the you, whole day. The whole day, and we actually oh. all knew the whole day. But we you did? Yeah, and so we have a little... Well, why didn't you invite me out for lunch or something? We have a little birthday surprise oh, for you. Because the surprise nice. is best at the end. Oh, Happy thank birthday, you very good much. sir. Wow. Hard to go with that. No age is revealed, of course. No, we'll best. try not oh, to tell nice, anybody. <laughs> Thanks a lot. You're close. What? <laughs> I'm even willing to share. Oh, and we even have this little surprise Look for you. Look at that. Uh, you know, <laughs> wow. How old were you there? I have no idea. My <laughs> wife asked me, she posted it on Instagram, and I'm like, what, where did you find that? We may have stolen that picture. We must have been married. So I'm going to say late 80s, early 90s. Yeah. Classy as always. The hair was. Uh, <laughs> you still look the same. Uh, yeah, yeah, right, sure. <laughs> Thanks, you guys. That's nice. You're welcome. <laughs> well, that's it for tonight. You can find our news program at cbc.ca slash bc, and Dan is here. No check? <laughs> no check. A lot of signatures. No check. <laughs> Good night.